So, let's figure out uh, some interesting way on how to obtain the carrier concentration. And this is done typically with a Hall experiment from the Hall effect. So, um, that is sort of the outline here um, that we followed in this section. And again, we had a relationship derived from mobility to doping and said, well, the doping has a, a strong effect on the mobility, so does temperature. But we haven't really shown a way in the assumption when we say, well, N is roughly ND, right? And therefore, we have resistivity and mobility. We haven't really shown you a way yet on how to calculate, say, the electron density or the, the doping that is related to it. So how do we do that? So here's a tidbit of uh, trivia, if you will. Um, er uh, Edwin Hor Hall, um, while he was working on his PhD uh, at John Hopkins, uh, discovered this effect in 1879. Now this is uh, a significant number uh, of years, 18 years, before the electron as such was discovered. And the Hall effect has been associated with uh, four Nobel Prizes uh, that, that really enabled subsequent work. And there's an interesting article here that I'm, uh, I'm referencing here. So, again, we are after calculating, obtaining the number of electrons in the system. So, let's uh, see what this measurement has looked like. Um, you take a slab, in our case of semi semiconductor material, and um, you put a coordinate system on it and give it certain dimensions that we will be using in a little while, and you apply a magnetic field. So you have a vertical magnetic field, and you apply a voltage to the system such that you drive a current that is orthogonal to the magnetic field. Okay, So you drive a current through this uh, slab of semiconductor, and in the orthogonal direction you apply a magnetic field. Now these are free carriers that are going to migrate in a uh, semiconductor, okay? And here's a picture, by the way, of a pretty large uh, type uh, magnetic system where you can do these experiments uh, to pretty high uh, magnetic fields. So if you want to reach a Tesla, and this is not a small magnet, but these are typically superconducting uh, cool magnets uh, where you have big um, coils. And here at the very center, in the middle of the um, device, you have a homogeneous magnetic field where you can now insert your probes and do these measurements, okay? So, what happens when you move a charge through a, a magnetic field? If you remember your freshman physics or high school physics, you know that uh, the charges, uh, if you have charge moving this way with an orthogonal magnetic field, and you have a, a vector here, you know that you're going to have a force where you um, that drives the, the carriers uh, orthogonal to the velocity. So ultimately you could uh, have circulating orbits or in a magnetic field uh, you can have uh, uh, something like this where the carriers are di um, just turned. Okay? That depends on the strength of the magnetic field and uh, on uh, whether this particle is actually truly moving freely. So here are the terms. We, we have the externally applied voltage to the system. We have the Lorentz force on the moving uh, electronic charge. And we have a relaxation term, again, in this uh, system where uh, the relaxation is reducing the voltage and slowing the electrons down. So these are the forces acting on the uh, electron. So, uh, as you apply a magnetic field um, in uh, the vertical direction, what you end up doing is you're pushing electrons, say, in this direction. And what you can then measure are actually uh, uh, piles of electrons here, and if you will, lack of electrons here. And um, you can measure a voltage that is building up between this distance here, and if you have, say, no conducting uh, uh, voltage measurements, then and you know what the distance here is, the distance d, you can um, 
devise uh, the number of electrons in the system, and I'll give you sort of the, the recipe of a small calculation on how that is being done. All right, so again, simple Newton's mechanics. Um, this works for holes just the same way, just uh, have slightly different signs. Let's carry this calculation through, okay? So we're now looking at the a velocity of the particle and we're saying, well, we're setting the force to zero and see what happens. We don't, uh, uh, we, and we can resolve this for the velocity of the particle that is now subject to uh, the drift force and to the Lorentz force like this, okay? And we have multiplied through with a tau. Uh, this tau was multiplied through, okay? Now we're going to assume that the magnetic field is small. So if it's small, for the argument's sake of this derivation, you can uh, leave it off of that expression and resolve this um, just like what we have done before and resolve this term for the velocity of the particles. Okay, And we can resolve it for the particle just in the same way what we had done before, which is just relating the velocity to the electric field, which is again the mobility in the system, right? Okay, so now we're doing sort of a slide trick. We plug, even though we kind of said, well, the magnetic field is weak, we're going to plug this, this velocity back into the equation anyways, and now we consider the magnetic field. So that means we're treating the magnetic field as a perturbation. And I'll talk a little bit more what that, what that perturbation means. All right, so we'll multiply these things through and um, have an expression now for the velocity of the particle where we divide it with the effective mass here, okay? So nothing fancy here. That seems just simple algebra. In fact, this sort of a high school type algebra. Now, when we say this term on the right must be small, what does that really mean? It means if you reformulate this term, you will see a term which is the cycloton uh, frequency or, uh, in, in the system, where I mentioned before, in a strong magnetic field, you can have electrons zoom around in a circle, right? Now, if tau times w, uh, omega c is much less than one. What does that mean? That means that the time for one magnetic orbit, which is one over WC, uh, omega c, is much, much larger than the relaxation time. That means the electron never makes a closed orbit, right? So it might start from uh, being directed and it has a scattering event. And then uh, that could go into any uh, direction. And then it starts again like this and gets scattered. And it, it starts like then, it gets scattered. This means in the system, under low magnetic field, you don't have closed orbits of these electrons. And overall, that means these carriers are all eventually, through scattering, are all piling up this direction, and they don't build closed scattering orbits like this on the edges, or they don't build orbits on the inside. Okay? Now, so it's the limit of strong scattering. Uh, let's uh, do uh, some further derivation with this. Let's relate this uh, velocity of these particles now to the current density. We know current is charge uh, times velocity. So here's the, here are the two terms. Here's Q, the charge. Here's the density of the electrons. And here's the velocity. All right. Now, if we plug this expression in for the velocity, nothing much happens yet, but we can now uh, reintroduce the resistivity rho that we had derived in the previous section, right? And this is now the conductivity, which is the inverse of this, and we can um, uh, plug these expressions in. Okay, so here, um, oh, previously we also had written down mu, the mobility as a function of tau n and mn, and we are assuming that we have an electron system, so nd is roughly n. So let's plug all of this in. So we plug these expressions in into the conductivity, 
and we have terms that we will find over on the right hand side. So now the current is an expression of conductivity of electric field and conductivity times mobility in an electric field across the magnetic field. Okay, so again cross term electric field is in this direction, magnetic field is up. All right, so now let's plug this in. This is a uh, how do we do a cross product, right? You have a coordinate system x, y, z, you plug in vector 1. These should be showing up here as little script E's for electric field rather than conduction bands and valence bands or y's, etc. with a magnetic field. And so you obtain a vector, right? Because this is vector jn that has two components, say in x and y. It doesn't have a z component. You can uh, multiply this out and find this uh, these two components. All right, now the Hall resistance is being defined as follows, where there is an additional approximation that is being introduced. You set this term to zero. What does that mean? So that means Jx equals sigma zero Ex, meaning the flow overall flow of the system is not being perturbed by the magnetic field. So the, the pileup of charge that we, I mentioned before is not overall changing the electron flow in the system. It's a small perturbation. So you're left over with a term on the bottom left over here. And you also assume that there is no current flowing in this direction, meaning you have a perfect voltmeter, which in general is pretty good. The internal resistance of a voltmeter is very, very high, so there's really no flow. It really tries to measure uh, the charge difference, if you will. All right, so now you have the magnetic field being known, you have the current that is known, you measure a voltage. The voltage is, of course, from the uh, giving you the electric field, and you need to know the size of your Hall bar like this, and then you can define a Hall resistance, which is, is the electric field, uh, magnetic field, the current density, all you're doing is resolving this, and you get the Hall resistance as 1 over Qn, where n is the number of electrons in the system. All right? So, this is a really fantastic way of getting to the free number of electrons that are flowing through the system by doing a perturbative measurement that doesn't uh, disturb the system very uh, strongly. It does depend on strong scattering inside of the device, this whole derivation. Um, if you have very clean material, you look at quantum materials, etc., you would use uh, different approximations, you pursue different physics, but here in the strongly scattered um, environment, this is a very fine derivation and it works experimentally really well. So, um, side remark, uh, we set this term over here to zero. You could carry this term through completely and at the end you end up with a term that is proportional to Bz squared. And if you, you, and if, you, if that's your expansion, then you, wanna, you would probably neglect the second order term and you come to the same result. But in the meantime, you have to uh, do a little bit more push-ups in, in your analytics work. So here's sort of the, the conclusion. A simple electrical measurement can now determine the concentration of free carriers inside of the sample. This is really a cool analysis tool. This is done today, even in research, all the time when people deal with new materials, two, uh, new two-dimensional materials, or um, they have grown structures and grown materials. They want to know what is the electron density in your system. They will make a Hall bar of their system and measure the whole Hall resistance in their system. So this is a key element for an experimental setup. It's a key element for characterizing materials. And once you have the uh, carrier concentration, you can then devise models for how much doping you have, etc. But uh, what you really need to do is you need to then measure these um, um, 
Hall experiments for different temperatures. Because you have to figure out whether you are in the extrinsic region or in the freeze-out region or the intrinsic region. So this is what we had discussed in the past, where really only in the extrinsic region can you say that the, um, the doping is, or the electron density is roughly uh, the doping. So the Hall, bar, Hall measurement will always give you n. It'll give you n here, it'll give you n here. But you still don't know what the doping is until you did a temperature-dependent measurement um, that would then resolve the, um, the ionization level or the release of uh, the donor electrons into the system. Okay? So, that being said, we're now in, uh, back in the outline of this segment here. We now have a way of calculating and measuring really a carrier concentration from the Hall effect. And the last segment will be uh, a relationship uh, between the diffusion coefficient and the mobility. And that will be in the next segment. So I'll see you then.